Hey now everybody, welcome back for part 3 of my top 50 games of all time. Luna. I really enjoy Steffenfeld games. I like just about every Steffenfeld game I've ever played, but this one is my absolute favorite. It's one of his earlier ones too. I really like the thematics of the game. Basically, it's like this moon princess is moving around these different islands and you are sending out your acolytes to sort of worship her and you're building temples and you need to collect different tokens uh, to be able to take various actions on the board. And basically, you're sailing yourself around in rowboats in these to these little islands and the islands are the action spaces. In the center is the big moon princess's tempo and you're trying to sort of do kind of like an area majority type thing in there. And it's a very similar mechanic to La Granja, which actually kind of was inspired by this one, where as you put your acolytes in that temple, it can kick out opponent's acolytes in there. Very interesting game. I really like this game. This is a game that when you teach it to somebody, their mind is bent. It is broken when you try to teach this game to them because you can't teach it properly because everything you teach needs to have been, something else needs to have been taught to understand what you're saying. So it's like this weird cyclical thing in the rules. Uh, it's not complex, it's just weird. And that's what I like so much about it because it's a, it's a different style of game, it's a different style of Euro game. The way my mind operates while trying to play Luna is different than every other Steffen Feld game, every other Euro game that I've experienced. This one just has tons of fun. The, the strategies are different, the tactics are different, the visuals are beautiful, and the theme is very cool too. Very much love Luna. Gaslands. Gaslands is a miniatures game that is the absolute most inexpensive miniatures game I've ever played ever. The book you can get on Amazon for like $14 and you play with Hot Wheels or Matchbox cars. You don't even have to do anything to them. You can just straight up play with those things. You do have to get some dice, but the rule book lets you just use straight up D6s and it translates to the, the custom dice that you can buy as well. So essentially, you could be into this miniatures game for under $20 if you wanted to, easily. Uh, you can spend a little more to get some of the extra templates and tokens and different things like that, but it's inexpensive. And not only that, it's such an awesome miniatures game. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's it's all in the dice combat in this game, the dice mechanics of this game. Uh, it feels kind of like a board game in a sense with the dice mechanics. Each one of the dice has different sides on it. It's like skids and slides and and gear up and stuff like and hazards. And when you roll a handful of dice based on what your car is, you have to use those dice to maneuver your car in different ways. And then you fire at them. So basically you're spending a skid so it'll skid and you spend a spin so the car will spin around and then you can spin it so that you're facing the other cars and you can fire machine guns, your rockets, you can throw grenades, you can shoot pistols, you can do whatever you want. It is such a fun game for such a low buy-in. And the hobby aspect, if you decide to get in on it, is tons of fun as well. You could go out and buy all kinds of little tiny guns. Like they have uh, guns for the minifigs that they, the Lego characters, right? Like they have third-party ones. I bought a big box full of them and I'm just attaching them to cars, painting the cars, making them look all banged up and beat up. I'm putting Warhammer 40,000 skulls on things. Man, this is just an overall awesome hobby experience and a game at the same time. The game is tactical and very fun. There's lots of different scenarios that you can play right straight out of the, bo the, the straight out of the book. Just a beautiful game. It's a simple miniatures game that is easy to get into, super inexpensive to get into. You probably have Hot Wheels cars lying around your house from when you were a kid and you never threw them out. Your wife's about ready to make you throw them out. Get them out and play some Gaslands. Great game. Nippon. I love building things, building things, modifying them, and making them operate to efficiency. This game really relies on that. It's an industry building game in which you have different factories in Japan that are building all these kinds of products and you're selling them to the various cities throughout Japan. You're exporting them as well. This game could really honestly be a war game if they just rethemed it because you're controlling these various cities. Uh, and basically in this one, you're 
via contracts, right? Like you're supplying these different products to these different cities and you are sort of the prime supplier of the cities. And what I love about it is how you have all these different factories and they're producing these products and you can build machinery that will help you uh, increase the efficiency of those factories and, and send them out. I love the that concept. I love the territory control concept of it. The whole board is beautiful. It's just everything about it really feels good. It feels like a good industry building game. It's one of my favorite industry building games. La Havre. Again, this is one of the older Euro games that I had in my collection, like one of the original games that we used to play. And still to this day, it holds up as one of my favorites. Basically, you're building a fishing town. The town starts off with a couple of buildings out that are owned by the town, and you're collecting resources of all different types, just tons of different resources, and every single one of them has an upgraded version. So there's a million things you can, you can do to get these different resources. Then you spend those resources to build buildings, which give you action spaces. Your opponents can take your action spaces, paying you. You have to feed your people. Uh, so you have to be building like fishing boats to bring in your food to feed your people. And what I really love about this game is that because it's a little older, we didn't get to that whole concept of streamlining and and really tailoring the game experience to what sells well. So this game can go on a really long time. And that's what I like about it. I feel like I can really sink my teeth into it. I can sit for three hours and maybe even a little more with a lot of games to really explore a long-term strategy. This game has long-term strategy. You start off, if you make mistakes, you can fix those mistakes because you have time to do it. A lot of Euro games today, like if you make one mistake, you're probably out of it because the game's gonna be over in 20 minutes or half an hour anyway. And other than that, it's just there's so many different avenues to go with different buildings and the, the randomness of the buildings really changes things up. What you build and how you combo those things together, how you buy the things to get your opponents to use them so you get resources for them, how you collect resources. Um, it's just a game that stood the test of time like no other. Fortune and Glory. Fortune and Glory, the cliffhanger game is what the full name is, is, I, I hate to keep saying it this way, but it's a dumb game. It's just straight up a dumb game. It's not well designed by any stretch. It's just fun. It's a fun Indiana Jones jet setting, searching for treasures, fighting Nazis, exploring temples, get like to the point where sometimes you're going into a, a city and you fight uh, a shark, then you fight a submarine, then you fight a gang of Nazis, and then you have to fight a Yeti. All in the same city, that's what happens. And there's no real story that plays out. You just have to create that story in your mind. And, and it's just such a fun game. It's such a pulp comic style game and everybody that's around the table is laughing and having a great time and, and making fun of people for, for failing and celebrating when people succeed. And you can play it as a competitive game, as a cooperative game, as a team's game. There's a million expansions that have all sorts of different, uh, you know, scenarios that you can play with different bad guys, Nazis, the mafia, like an ancient cult, all different stuff. It's, it's one of those games that when I was little, if I would have gotten this for Christmas, I will, it would have been the best Christmas ever because I got this giant box of miniatures and maps and boards and cards and I just would have been in love with it. And the little kid in me still loves that stuff. I have such a fun time when I play this game, despite the fact that it's not designed very well, but who cares? If it's fun, it's fun. And I love it. Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game. There have been so many different versions of the computer game Sid Meier's Civilization that was brought to the table. This one's still my favorite. This one, I just think, captures a lot of what made the, the, the video game fun, but then streamlined out all the stuff that didn't matter. I feel like it's a good long-term sitting game. There's a new one that came out called A New Dawn, which I thought was good, but it really didn't feel like Civilization. This one feels like civilization. It lets you sink your teeth into building a cool civilization and upgrading your cities with all kinds of different buildings and sending out your armies to annihilate your opponents. Uh, it, it's, it's such a neat game. There are flaws to it, I will say. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's perfect or anything. Uh, I do think that 
some strategies are boring and some strategies that are boring are actually a little more, a little easier to win with. Don't dig that. I wish that you could do more uh, of everything. I, did, I wish that if you just didn't, you know, sort of pigeonhole yourself and, and you know, put the, the blinders on and just go for a strategy, the game isn't as fun as if you just do everything. Uh, so if somebody's doing that, they're just going to win. So it's not the perfect game, but it really gives me this vibe of building a civilization like most other games don't. I love Through the Ages, but it's just a card game. This one gives you like that that whole feeling of exploration and building and, and its spatial relations. It's a great civilization game. Still, still holds up today. Star Trek Ascendancy. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. And this game is 100% the best Star Trek game ever designed. It's actually a good game, a perfect game, but it's a good game. But it really gives you everything that you want out of Star Trek. It gives you the races. It gives you the inside jokes, the, the episodes on the cards. It gives you, you know, all of the races feel like what they are. You know, Klingons are very uh, attack oriented and the Federation is very exploration oriented. And the Ferengi, if you get that expansion, they're all about the, the rules of acquisition. And it just gives you exactly what you want when it comes to Star Trek. And that's what Gale Force 9 excels at. Gale Force 9, every single one of their games, it's theme first. Theme and feeling and being true to the intellectual property that they're working with. And it always works. Almost always. I've never had a situation where I didn't feel that Gale Force 9 really hit the nail squarely on the head with really making you feel like they're being respectful of the fans of the intellectual property they're, 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 they're dealing with here. And Star Trek Ascendancy is perfect. Huge game, all kinds of stuff in it. Wonderful experience to play the game. I absolutely love it. Anachrony. Mind Clash games just can't do wrong. Every single one of their games is good. Dracarion, Anachrony, Cerebria. They're just all so wonderful. And this one is my favorite of all of them that have come out thus far. Uh, it is such a crunchy Euro game with such a cool theme. It's about time travel. You're in the future and you're trying to go back in time to help previous members of your civilization survive a cataclysm that happens sort of in between. You're sending things back to them, but you have to make sure that you have them in the future so that you can send them back to you. It's kind of got that weird time paradox thing going with it and it makes it work. It feels like time travel. It feels like you're running some sort of industry that's that's in the future, that's sort of trying to make the civilization survive. And then by the end of the game, you have to get off the planet before the second cataclysm happens. Man, it's it's all well done all throughout the, the from beginning to end. The production's great. The, the game is fun. The strategy is solid. Anachrony every day. I love it. Magic the Gathering. I don't play much magic. I will admit that. Uh, I don't have a lot of people that want to play Magic, but I'll tell you, if I had a group of friends around me that still wanted to play Magic regularly, I would be in all the time. Because it is by far, in my opinion, the best CCG, LCG, any kind of collectible type card game that's ever been designed. It's the granddaddy of them all, and it did it best. Still to this day, it boggles my mind how absolutely simplistic the game is. There's so few mechanics to the game, and it still has such a depth of strategy. Now, granted, they put in all sorts of, you know, new powers in the expansions and stuff, but they're all specific to each one of the sets. And once you're playing that set, you kind of learn the, the new rules, and then they go away for some new ones coming in. But the core of the game is so simplistic that... It's, it's, it's elegant. It's the most elegant game, probably one of the most elegant games desi ever designed. Richard Garfield hit it on the mark on this one. Magic the Gathering, fantastic game. Dreadfleet. Now this is one that most people probably don't care about or maybe never even played before because it was a games workshop big box game that came out some years ago that uh, nobody bought. Uh, it was not a very good seller for them. I've seen it on shelves for very expensive prices in years past. Uh, it is a ship combat game uh, in the style of Man of War, which is a Games Workshop ship miniatures game from years ago that was defunct. And this is sort of their, their sort of nod to that game coming back as a one-shot box set. 
Uh, it has, sh you know, fantasy races with their ships and they're sailing around fighting each other. It's a nautical miniatures game. And nautical miniatures are my favorite. I just really like nautical miniatures games. And this one does it so damn well. Uh, there's magic and there's uh, strange events that happen on the board and weather and sea monsters that pop up and attack your ships. And each one of the ships is so diverse in the way that it operates in the game. The dwarves have steamships with giant cannons and the, you know, the, the vampire has like all sorts of ghosts and creepy things that can happen on his ship. And the, and the humans just have a straight up giant pirate ship type thing beautiful game. The miniatures are absolutely gorgeous and it was the most fun I've ever had modeling and painting miniatures in my life and I, and and it's just a fun game besides. The production is completely great and the game is really, really good. So if you ever get a chance to play Dreadfleet, I highly recommend you do it. Thanks for joining me for my part three. Come on back tomorrow for part four of my 50 favorite games of all time. Thanks so much, everybody. If you've enjoyed this video, please do us a giant favor by subscribing to the channel and clicking that wacky bell icon. If you're into board games, miniatures games, role-playing games, we have a bunch of audio podcasts you might enjoy. You can find those at thesecretcabal.com or on iTunes and Stitcher.